Hi everyone, we are back for another installment of working on this Barbarian game in Construct 2. And this video is going to be a little different. I already made several changes and I'm actually just going to review them with Corey here to show him what I did and at least a little bit go into how I made those particular changes and why. So uh, say hi Corey. Hey, how's it going? All right, so first thing that you might notice that's different. I am still sharing screen, right? Yeah, it looks like I am. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just added a text thing here to the HUD layer that I can drag down when I need to so I can do debugging. I just add a line of code. Let's see if it still exists. Let me type in text. Yeah, so you can see here set text to whatever. Okay, yeah. And that just, in this case, I was working on the camera stuff, so that's one of the first things I changed, which is not very noticeable unless you're comparing the previous video directly um, mm -hmm. to what you're about to see, but... Alright, so now you can see the text that I just dragged on. That's showing me the Y position of the camera. Uh -huh. Oh, and there's new sound effects that you cannot hear, Corey, but everyone else should be able to. Alright. And it's a little harder because I have enemies coming from the left and the right now, which is another thing I added. But anyway, I also, while I was tweaking the camera, all it does is better uh, protect the ability for the screen to shake. I made the screen shake more um, consistent universally, no matter what no matter how high the character is mm -hmm. on the screen. And then I was able to make the screen shake a little less subtle. Um, and so I was using the, uh, the text to just keep track of exactly where the Y position of the camera ends up in every, any given circumstance. So, anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah, it looks like you've also got the... Uh Air bash working on the on the yes men so no yes problem. oh that's right yeah I can bash them in the face now that's one of the things I want to talk to you about as far as gameplay um, some ideas I have let's hit him now too oh, hold on a second oh, just missed uh, oh there we go uh. <laughs> okay <laughs> so um, one thing that is going to be cool, remember how you created that second variation of a getting hit frame for the Birdman? Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it so when you bash him with the air bash move, he's going to display that animation instead of the standard hit, and he's going to side slide back more and farther. And okay. while he's sliding back that way, he, he can actually bump Birdman that are behind him. Mm. So you can get a cool chain reaction thing going. And similarly, we're going to be probably in the very next video adding the first power-up you can get. And what I'm going to do is, um, it's going to be the, the fire variant. And before I, I had this idea of a general fire power-up, which is kind of what you would expect in any kind of game where you get power-ups, like magical power-ups, you, you expect the kind of elemental ones like electricity mm -hmm. and fire and stuff. But I also had this idea of what was going to be a different one, which was a, an explosive force um, oh, yeah. that would make them blow up. But I realized I could potentially merge the fire one and the explosive force into the same thing and make it so that when you're doing the regular slash, it emits uh, a little like fire trail. and But when you do the bash, that's when it would imbue the enemy you hit with fiery energy and the enemy that's going flying it'll have unique frames that make it look like it's like red and kind of pulsing with fiery energy and that will um, blow up when it uh, when it hits the ground in in a bigger explosion animation that also in turn the explosion itself if that hits an enemy it will uh, do the chain reaction thing. That's the plan. Yeah, yeah. So, I like that. Anyway, oh, the other thing I was thinking of doing was making... Are you... Yep, go ahead. Well, uh, I was going to say, like, with any of these magical sort of... I guess they would be gauntlets uh, uh -huh. or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think 
we would have anything like changing the range of his attacks or anything yes. with those or that's what i was thinking but. yeah definitely it, and we just we'll just get to keep playing with the distance that each one comes out until it just feels the best for the gameplay so that we can make each one very different from each other but i was definitely picturing the fire one like the standard attack blur coming out quite a bit farther mm -hmm. and obviously looking quite different so definitely and then i'm even considering adding uh, it depends on how i work out the controls but for example i could do sort of a castlevania style thing where holding up and then pressing the attack will throw a fireball if you have the firepower that would be very cool so yeah. there would be like the regular slash the bash slash which is down an attack and then a very long range attack that maybe would be the weakest of those attacks but would cover uh, a much longer distance longer range attack mm -hmm. so uh, i just need to figure out because i do want to offer a a control scheme for this particular game that actually matches or that works with a one button controller and that matches the what is that game black belt the name was so generic i couldn't remember uh, <laughs> yeah. black belt on the sega master system that was the original inspiration for this gameplay design uh, Karate where, guys. yeah exactly <laughs> where up is jump and um and then you have an attack button. Although in Black Belt there were two buttons. One was for punch and the other was for kick. But we mm -hmm. don't really... This guy's not much of a kicker. So I, I'm going to try to see if I can figure out how to make... Make it comfortable and easy to get out all of the moves in the Black Belt sort of style and with only one button. So that would be a problem with up and attack being how you get out the fireball move because up would be jump in that case yeah so but i'll give that some thought i'm sure there's i'm sure there's a way to do it and uh i just have to figure it out but anyway yeah so the i also did uh some people may have noticed i slowed down the player movement i sped up the speed of the extreme foreground bushes and tree layer um mm -hmm. And I slowed down his general movement. I also slowed down the gravity and the jump inertia and stuff a little bit. This was specifically to make it match the actual Amiga Emos version right now. But then we can, we can tweak, we can speed up the Amiga version, uh, if we decide that's better or sl like I just slowed this one down. I don't, I don't think I want it any slower than this, but yeah, it does give me more control. Yeah, a pretty good pace. Uh, yeah. And the exactly. environment. It moves in such a way to add the excitement, but it's not overbearing. Right. You know, it's, um, but, and I think it just is because it's that thin strip as opposed to, if it was right. really chaotic foreground, it might, it might be look too kind distracting of or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I think it works great. So. Right. so that's one of the things I did. And one of the other really important things I did is I finally fixed the really bad input bug that I want to explain what was happening. Let's see, player input. So the most important thing, originally in these, and I fixed it for keyboard input as well, even though I've been using an actual Xbox controller. So I'll explain it in the uh, controller events, but it's the same exact thing in keyboard events. Right here, when someone is pressing to the right or to the left, originally, if you recall, I was just adding to left, right input, or subtracting one from left right input. And what I didn't realize is amazingly enough, during gameplay, it's actually possible, at least with this Xbox controller, it was actually possible for me within less than one cycle, uh, one game loop of, of the logic, mm -hmm. I could actually switch from holding to the left or the right so that as far as it was concerned there was never a zero state there was there was never a state where i was neither holding left or right mm. it was instantaneously first i was holding left and then the very next loop of the code i was holding right so even though i would think because you can't hold left and right at the same time right i would have thought you know certainly it would it would be slower than a 60th of a second that there would be at least one loop cycle where it would be at a zero state. Mm -hmm. So that's what was causing all those failed attempts. And 
So anyway, so what I needed to do, what I realized was happening because of that, is if you can imagine, I was I kept adding to or subtracting to this left or right. But let's say I've been holding to the right already for several seconds. So that left right input number might be way up to like a hundred or a million or a thousand or whatever. And then when I start holding to the left, instead of it going to zero and then starting to subtract immediately, what it's doing is it's still at positive million mm, and then yeah. it starts subtracting one. So it's going to stay a negative number for a long time. So the character's not going to turn around until minus one, minus one, minus one per every loop finally brings it all the way back down to a negative number instead of that positive number. All right. So that's what was happening. So what I did was I changed the code to set left or right input to, and then a maximum of these two possibilities, which is left or right input plus one, which is what it used to be, add one to left or right but it has to be at least one. So as soon as you're holding to the right, it's got to be at least one or left, right input plus one. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it just mm -hmm. guarantees that it can't possibly stay a negative number once you start holding to the right. And it's the same exact thing when you start holding to the left, it makes sure now we're doing minimum. So it has to be at most, oh, look at that. It's still not perfect. I have one here and this should actually be negative one. I didn't catch that, so let me fix that. It, it was still good enough that it made my character, like, at worst case scenario, it would have stuck on one, and then the very next loop cycle, it would have been zero and then negative one. Mm -hmm. And that would have been so fast that I wouldn't notice my character is not turning around. It would have still been quite responsive. Two loop cycles is at most probably like a 30th of a second. Right on this PC. So, but it still is a bug technically. So, I want to clean that up while I'm here. So that's this one here, and this should be negative one. So that was the biggest cause of the problem. I did also in the gameplay events add something as well, which I did do a comment for. All right, here's the controller input fix. Let's see. Oh, I see. Yeah, there are two versions now. That's what it is. You see this one here? If he's not on the floor uh -huh. and he's in the punch, but you're holding left or right. Before, if you jumped up in the air and you punched, you would stop moving to the left or right. You wouldn't be able to move, continue moving to the left or right if you had punched. So you, suddenly your inertia would come to a dead stop. Where yeah, obviously right, if you're right. jumping forward and holding forward and you throw a punch, you should keep going. You should right. carry that inertia over. So this fixed that stiffness, that weirdness, where if you jumped in the air, you would not. And that's because stuck and move. Because usually what you do is you check for stuck and move. So where, oh, so here it is up here. Uh, stuck and move is zero, left and right input. So this won't work because if you're punching, then stuck and move equals one. Right. So this takes care of everything for when you're on the ground and when you're in the air and not punching. And this takes care of if you're in the air and punching, you should still be able to carry your inertia by continuing to hold left or right. So the controls are much better now, and boy, does it make a difference. I, I fail a lot less at uh, hitting the bats with the bash, which makes the game drastically more fun. Yep. So that was... Some of the big code changes, the other thing I already mentioned in passing was I added the spawner for Birdman going to the coming from the left. Mm -hmm. So all that was was cloning this uh, the right sprite, flipping the image, uh, naming it Birdman spawner left. And then I just placed a few of those. So now the game level is quite difficult. Uh, oh, there's another thing I did. I have the spriter spreader animation open for it i uh -huh. separated you had mentioned this and i uh it was definitely good advice i separated the attack tell animation okay from yeah. the actual attack so the actual attack immediately starts with the attack frame and then does its fade out with the blur and then the tell is just that one tell frame to give the player a chance to get in there and get off his shorter range attack before the Birdman can attack him. What's cool is this has a half a second 
timing built into it. However, so once I altered the code in here, so we can see here, these are the events that control the Birdman. So I rearranged it a little. So I said, if the Birdman is walking or idle and he's within attack range, this one guarantees if he's in, within his own attack range limit minus 20, so he's quite close to the player, then he's guaranteed to attack, right? Remember that problem before where sometimes he'd walk right through the player having never right. attacked? So this guarantees once he gets to an even smaller distance from his maximum attack range, you know, within that 20 pixel range, then he's going to definitely attack. But we still have this one here, where if he's within the attack range, but not that close to the player, then it's going to randomize it. This is very similar to the original event we had, that every tenth of a second, if his attack likelihood is, uh, if a random number up to 10 is lower than or equal to that number, that frequency variable we created for the Birdman, then he'll attack. So, okay. and then what we did was, you'll see, instead of playing the attack animation, which was called punch, instead he plays punch tell. So then we needed this event that says, when punch tell is finished, then go to punch, which is the actual sword swing. And then we, oh yeah, the other thing I did, which was, so you see here, when I, when we go to punch tell, we set the playback speed ratio of the animation we just set to 0 0.6, which is a little more than half. Technically, that would be twice the speed, I think. Uh, so it, it does start being a little less than half the speed, but then I'm also adding a random up to another little more than half the speed or 60% of the speed. So it'll at least be 60% of the speed, or it could be 120% of the speed. So you've got okay. this little range difference of how long he'll stay in the attack tell animation before it attacks, just so there's this tiny bit of randomness to how long he waits before he attacks in the mm -hmm. actual tell. So that's what that does. And then... So, yep, so presently, is there ever a time when they are actually like idling or not walking? Or? Not yet, but I was going to add that because the other thing I added... So let's see. And then the important thing is I think the way sp the Spider plugin works is once you set a playback speed ratio, it's not for the specific animation. I think it sets it for everything from then on and until you return the playback speed ratio to the normal speed which is 1.0 mm -hmm. so you'll see it says on animation punch tell finished set playback speed ratio to one and in fact what i really should do is also add it because it is possible he'll never finish the punch tell he might get attacked out of it and then all of his animations i should say will be slightly off in their timing they'll be either almost half speed or a hundred and up to 120 percent speed mm -hmm. so i need to add another event that basically says i'll just copy and paste this and we'll delete this stuff and we will copy this so is current animation punch tell and we're going to invert this. So now, if his animation that's playing right now is not punch tell, it'll guarantee the animation speed goes back to the standard full speed. All right? Okay. So yeah. let me save that. And then what else did I do? Oh, yeah, somewhere. I think it's called mirror for spider objects, hero. Let's see. Somewhere I have it now where the Birdman... Okay, so if he's walking or idle and the Birdman is to the left of the player, mm -hmm. then we swap his angle of mo movement and the mirroring to make him face the player. So this makes the Birdman always turn so long as he's not stuck mid-swing or if he's stuck in the getting hit sequence or he's stuck swinging or doing the swing tell, then he'll, in those circumstances, he can't just turn around instantaneously. But as right. soon as he's not stuck in the middle of something, 
he'll turn around to face the player or walk toward the player. So if you managed to jump over them or you were invulnerable and you walked through them to the other side, they will turn around at their nearest chance to do so. So that's another thing I added. All right, I just remembered another thing that I had done, and that is originally we had a problem with the birdmen when they were spawned. Each of them was at a slightly different Y coordinate. There was nothing making sure that they were perfectly at ground level. And you could see I was sloppy with the placement. So you could see this one here is a lot higher. I can make a yeah. rectangular shape so we could see that. He's a good uh, four or or more pixels too high, and they're just they're not all carefully placed. But I also don't want us to have to be that careful when we're placing these. Right. So what I did is I simply added to the on start of layout. On start of layout. Here it is. I have a sub event now or two sub events that for each of the Birdman spawner uh, sprites. It goes through each one of them. That's what the for each loop does. We set its Y to the exact position of the top of the floor collide. So the floor collide is hidden now. But the point is that there is, I'll just do this. See that red sprite there? Or actually it's a tiled background object. So the bounding box top is the exact top pixel coordinate there. Mm -hmm. So on any level, no matter where that is, if we've placed these ground enemy spawner things, then it's going to immediately put them all exactly on top of the ground because if you look at the actual anchor point, it's at the exact bottom. Mm -hmm. So it's going to align the exact bottom with the exact top of that ground, which is also how it works for the player. Right. So the player, because he does have the platform behavior, and because that is there, you could put you could start the level with him up here, but he's just going to fall and land perfectly on the ground. Mm -hmm. So this just ensures all of the bird people are on the same exact ground level as well. And then one thing that I did want to do quickly that I haven't done yet if you don't mind, what I want to do is add, finally add the code since we have the art in that makes these buttons change and darken and look depressed when you, and I don't mean sad, I mean look pressed down when, um, when you actually hold an input on the keyboard or controller or things like that. So let me go into the event sheet. Let's see, should I add this? I think I will add this to the player input stuff. So I'll just make a group. I'll be a little organized this time. Add group, and we'll call this update buttons. We'll do, yeah, that's fine. So we're going to compare a variable, which is going to be left or right input, is greater than a zero. That's good. Then that's going to the right. So we need the, oh, I didn't rename that to down apparently, but the right button, we want to set the animation to pressed. That's what the animation is called with the artwork in it. And then we can just copy and paste that and we could actually invert that. So if it's not greater than zero, then we could change it back to default. And I'm just going to really quickly run the game to make sure that it's working. Make sure I have my logic right before I do the same for all the other buttons. There we go. So I have the uh, obviously the um, little anchor point a tiny bit misaligned, I think. Mm -hmm. It seems to be shifting position in a way it shouldn't, but the logic works. So I'll just worry about that part for now and get it working for all the buttons and then I can tweak the coordinates later on. Uh, so oh, I'm in the wrong event sheet, clear input. So now I can just copy and paste that and change this to be, uh, that's the same, we'll do less than zero and we'll edit this to less than zero. And we're going to 
We're going to replace the object and we're replacing it with the left button. Okay, that's it for that. Copy and paste this again. And now we are going to do, we'll do the up button. So replace object and we're going to do the up button. And now we need to change this variable to up down and less than is indeed up and then change this and up down okay that's good so now we'll do the down button so replace that object where is it there uh, replace object and down button which is currently called left button three i'll fix that in a minute and so now up down has to be greater than zero so this it's already um yep it's already down so it gets super depressed <laughs> that is true so then we need to change these to replace object the i thought i just did this oh no yeah i did i just got fooled because it's called left button silly me so oh, right. um, yeah let me go back here and fix this to be down button all right and now we just need to do the b and a for now as well oops clear input So now we are going to do replace object and we are going to do we'll do the B button first and change this to be B1 for button one uh, greater than zero B1 and I already replaced that, so that should be fine. Oh, actually, should that should be one be the A button? Button one is A. That's a good question. Uh, well, we'll uh, soon see. I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, how you had that set up. Me um, neither. B two. B two. And. Yep, okay. Place object. And we need B button. Presumably, oh no, I did a, I did B button first, so A button. So I might need to re reverse these, but we'll know in a second here. Mm -hmm. There we go. So up, down, left, right. That's all working very well. Yep, no, that's good. Well, it's good in a sense. That's the way they're lined up. But on an Xbox controller, I think this is an Xbox One controller. I'm not sure anymore. No, this one is a 360. But so the, the looks... button is labeled A that's on the left, and this is labeled B. Oh, yeah, I have those backwards. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Just about yeah. to point that out. Okay. Putting B on top of A, but not, yep. but not the other one. So. Yep. Okay. All right. A little sloppiness there so what we're going to need to decide uh, we might need to reverse the labels B and A because at least most PC owners will be going with the Xbox controller variants so A tends to be on the left and B on the right okay. so yeah I guess I'll switch it does that make sense what about yeah, when we, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean it I guess it doesn't matter that much, but yeah, for, for the consistency of the Xbox, it definitely makes sense. Right, so. okay. So now that I've done that... Yeah, they did that weird thing where they labeled them like, uh, sort of like the Nintendo buttons, but they right. switched them around or whatever, like, uh, yeah. so it's not exactly the same. All right, so let's see if I have the pressed A. There it is, right there. There we go. Maybe that will fix the offset issue on this particular one, too. I don't think it will. I just cropped them differently, like a, like a noob. Okay, that's all right. I'm good enough for now. I just want to get it functioning, and then I'll clean it up when it's not recording, because that's just lazy. Or not lazy, but it's just kind of boring 
work of tweaking the position of the uh, hot spot or recropping the images to make them cropped exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Otherwise that was good, but now I need to switch the logic right for those buttons. Player input. So I think I need to do this now. Let's see if I am correct. So now they should be properly labeled A and B. A, B. Yep, okay. Now it matches the Xbox controller. And the button that I expect to be jumped, the button on the left, still jumps. All right, that's good. All right, all working. I just need to uh, tweak their images at a later point. It was relatively painless. We even fixed some little oversight issues. But anyway, so getting back on point, there was a very important bug that Corey had noticed that we, I will demonstrate right now. And that is currently when the birdmen are on screen, they always attack at the exact same time, even the ones. So it's back to the synchronized dancing thing. Mm -hmm. So that should not be happening. So I need to take a look at the gameplay events and I can use this search to narrow it down because I know it's the event that has punch tell in it. So here it is. So here's the logic for it. So let's take a look. This checks what animation it's playing. So that should narrow it down at least to birdmen that specifically are either playing walk or idle. But that does not narrow it down completely. But then we have these other sub events that then check some uh, calculations comparing variables and doing some math. So obviously the problem is because we're doing these fancy math checks here in this code, it's lost track of which particular birdman that that we're talking about. So it's affecting all of them. So what I should be able to do is I'm going to add uh, add an event that simply does another for each. That seems to be the topic of this video for each object. So for each birdman. And now I'm going to just grab this entire event here that controls the Birdman. And I'm going to make it a sub-event of that. So now this should, in theory, make it definitely only try each Birdman one at a time th through the loop cycle. And um, so, so during that one loop of logic, it's going to say, okay, let me check all of these things for one Birdman at a time, go through them all and only affect the birdmen that, that, that match all of these criteria, basically. So let's see if that fixed it. Let's get those birdmen on screen. Cue music. All right, nice. excellent. Nice. Okay, so now they are all attacking when they actually should be and not as a dance troupe. That is... Yeah, it seems to be working great. Some good progress there. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to mention, what I'm thinking of doing to sort of adding more of that risk versus reward gameplay right now, the heart appears very frequently and it's just on a random generator. Mm -hmm. So what I'm thinking of doing is having a nice effect and adding a few things to the UI. I'm thinking of basically two kinds of energy. Mm -hmm. One that would be like health energy and one that would be like attack energy or magic energy in general. So the idea would be that you're filling up. So every enemy, like let's say the flying enemy, every flying enemy you destroy will release one kind mm -hmm. of energy and it'll just be like a magic glowing shape or glittery thing or whatever. Right. And it'll just appear for a second after the enemy is done exploding and then it'll fly up to that part of the HUD up there and it'll like that HUD will glow for a second and then fill up a little more. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then every time it fills up completely, then it, like if it's the health type energy, once that fills up, then the health thing will appear, will fly across the screen, at least within a, a certain amount of time, maybe with some little amount of randomizing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you'll know when it's coming soon because you filled that up. And mm -hmm. then, uh, so it would be one for one for attack energy and the other for the different power-up you're going to get in that given level. 
like the firepower or whatever yeah. other different powers that we end up giving to the player. So that plays on the idea. We had discussed that idea several videos back that there's this guy that's helping you. Mm -hmm. And like he's a, basically a wizard or alchemist or something. And he's the one that either gave you the gauntlets or explained to you how to use the gauntlets or something. And so we can make him say, like, you need to collect a certain amount of this energies for me to be able to conjure this thing and send it your way. Right. And then there's the two different kinds of energy. So that's what I'm thinking of doing to make it cohesive. And we can still make it so occasionally, randomly, he might, or at specific parts of level, like maybe regardless of what you've generated or if you have not generated enough yet, maybe sometimes he's also trying to build up or collect that kind of energy himself so sometimes maybe it it will be more random or in specific places like he'll give you something special uh -huh. but otherwise i kind of like the idea of you're sort of earning your way to it which will encourage people to not just try to dodge every enemy and keep running forward right they, right. right they'll feel the need to uh, to destroy more of the enemies and maybe we'll do like a multiplier bonus where you, like if you bash enemies into others and stuff like that, maybe it'll make more of that energy appear out of the destroyed enemies or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's the plan for the next video is to, before the next video, I'll probably tweak these uh, pressed button image anchor points or hotspots so that they stay in the exact right place when they're pressed. But then in the next video, like before then, I'll have done the art required for the fire power up and we'll actually add all that logic in and get that gameplay working for the fire power. Right, right. So there is, I just remembered one more thing I started doing. I realized what we can do is consolidate these objects, which I already started doing but did not finish. And that is, you see how I renamed the bat to bashed enemy? Uh -huh. And now he has different animations. He has the bat version and the falcon animation. And he'll also have like flaming bat, flaming falcon, uh, whatever, ice bat, ice falcon, all that kind of stuff. Whatever powers we give, like the different bash variants. Uh -huh. And we could do the same thing for the flying bats, so we, uh, flying enemies, so we have bat and falcon. So that's going to make it much easier for me to do that thing I wanted to, where I had universal code. Right. Because now I can just create variables that say like, if you get hit, switch to this animation, but instead of just naming a, um, a very specific animation, I can use a variable that would be like, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, I'm not going to do this during this video, I'm just explaining ahead, but in here, so now these will be the spawners for any walking enemy, left or right, and there's going to be a value in here that's going to um, say bird or bat or whatever and then the, in the code there's going to be a variant of the code that says if the variable is set to bird then create bird um, right and then so what it's going to do is it's going to or i shouldn't be saying that for the bird man but for the flying enemies for sure all it's doing is creating the same sprite which is just flying enemy but it's going to say change the animation to match that exact string. So, for example, I would just go in here and add the instance variable. So you can see we're already able to set the speed of each generated thing. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to add another thing, which will be a text variable. And it'll just say which, which enemy. And, for example, this would be... Uh, bird or uh, did I call it bird or falcon I think I called it falcon uh, falcom is back uh, falcon there we go so it's going to say uh, just create that general thing and then change its animation to and then the value which enemy mm -hmm. so in other layouts it'll just be which enemy will set it to bat or whatever whatever the flying right. enemy is for that and then same thing, like when this is hit, it's going to know, and in fact, I'm going to pass that variable along. So let's just do that right now. And so in this flying enemy, we're going to also give it 
a text variable that will also be called which enemy. So we're going to be passing this string value along from the spawner to the actual thing just so it knows what kind of enemy it's, it is as well. So this will be falcon by default. And then so when when it gets hit by the player bash and it creates just a general bashed enemy then it's going to know which animation to switch it to as well which is the same exact name which you can see as bat or falcon mm -hmm. so that way it's nice and tidy we're not going to need different sprites for each one it's just going to be and that way we can have the universal code for any bashed, any type of bashed flying enemy hitting into any kind of ground-based enemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just got the groundwork started for that. So that's another thing that I'll probably do, just because it's a lot of kind of boring work. I'll probably do some of that off video too. But uh, that that's another thing I I have in the works to further tidy up the code a bit. But that's uh, that's about all I had in mind for this particular video. Did you have any thoughts or thing or things you'd like to see? Oh, I guess I should also design and get that HUD art ready for the two different energy types. Yeah, my, uh, one thing I was going to mention about that with the HUD mm -hmm. is it does look like we may have to, I don't know, play with the spacing a bit mm -hmm. because it looks like there's not much space there to put that. Right. And it might get a little crammed in the middle. So. Yeah, I was thinking about moving this over a few pixels this way. Uh, yeah. And this over a few pixels this way, perhaps. And I was thinking vertical bars that you fill up, so they can actually be quite small. Like two different okay. colored vertical bars. Uh, so you, I don't need a lot of space, but it'll look right, a little right. weird if there's two there and they're not perfectly centered. Yeah. So I do feel like I need to move these over a little bit and... Maybe Are use those, this from here. Yeah. Um, regarding the HUD, you know, mm -hmm. you've got the sort of gauntlet like things on the left yeah. and right. Do are those going to serve a purpose later on? No, uh, no. Or they are purely there right now, just to add some graphical element to the HUD, some kind of quote unquote framing, but mm -hmm. and just sort of a visual theme. But they that was definitely just uh, kind of placeholder art to put okay. something there and start to get a feeling for the style. But well, I wondered if, yeah. I mean, you said you were going to have two kind of small meters. I wonder if, like, right. you could we could do something with those two side gauntlets to make them those actual things, you know? Yeah, that, that's um, a great idea, because not only could we do that, we can make these get brighter and brighter instead of bars that fill up. Right, right. And yeah. we could just change this art. And then the other thing we could do, potentially, to further consolidate communication is have the actual gauntlet images change depending on what power-up you get, what type of gauntlet. Yeah. And yeah. eventually I do plan on... Let's see, I don't have that folder open at the moment. But um, I plan on it creating character maps in the Spriter file that actually visually represent the different gauntlet types you can get. So your character will actually change even his idol and just even when he's not attacking, he'll look different. He'll have different looking gauntlets on his arm. Mm -hmm. So he'll have like cool red orange gauntlets when he's uh, in fire mode and stuff like that. Yeah. So that'll be pretty cool too. So we can, and I'm thinking of making it so that when you grab the power up that changes what kind of, what, like it basically transforms your gauntlets. He'll like pause in the air, so since he'll always be jumping up in the air to grab it, like right. it'll do that. You know how it does the time pause right now when you do the bash thing. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of doing the same time pause, but maybe changing the color tinting of the entire background, which would be a simple palette change on the Amiga, and mm -hmm. then having a cool animation where he goes into like a pose, like facing forward on the screen with a cool like powering up pose. And then, like, have the gauntlets change. Right, right. And maybe do a cool voice sample or something. Yeah. yeah. Power up. <laughs> right. I have the power. That's right. Uh, but, yeah, that's the plan. So that that's going to be the cool stuff that I want to uh, get done, or at least mostly get done in the next video. Is And by that point, we're going to have something very closely approaching, at least seemingly feature complete level. The only mm -hmm. thing we would need to do at that point is make it so that at the end of the level, 
you can actually exit the level and it would go to the next screen. But obviously in the final version, we're going to have bosses and sub-bosses on a given level. Right. So eventually we'll add that, that code that's going to make it where we can designate where a specific boss or sub-boss is and then create basically a screen anchor that says when you get to this point, stop the scrolling and don't let the player scroll anywhere past this point until that enemy is destroyed. Right. And then the scrolling will wake back up, basically. Did they do that? I mean, I know they... I thought they did that in Black Belt, right? Where yeah, it, I, it would sort of go along until it was like a sort of setting or scene, yeah. and then guys would just still keep coming in on that one screen or something like that. Yeah, I think uh, it I was... I can't remember exactly. Uh, it was certainly like that in the bosses, where the scrolling would, would, would stop when you're dealing with sub-bosses on the level. And oh, okay. I think even, but I don't remember, I've not played the game in years, I really should play it again, since we're working on this, just in case I get reminded of something to do or not do. Right. Um, but there's, uh, I'm pretty sure it does that thing like, like Mario, where, uh, or the, I should say the first Super Mario Brothers game, where you scroll from left to right, and then you can't go back anymore. Like, it only scrolls in one direction. Right, yeah. So I'm thinking of doing the same thing to some extent, maybe, or at least in some portions, where once you get to a certain point, almost like checkpoints, mm -hmm. then you can't scroll back anymore, which on the real Amiga version will help with memory, because we could potentially... Like, while you're fighting the boss, it could be loading in new graphics and dumping graphics you don't need anymore. Yeah, because, I mean, it seems like you're going to be progressing the one direction. I, I don't yeah. know if there would ever really be a reason for you to have to go back, you know, right. ever. Or really. if so, only a very short distance to chase down an enemy you really wanted to kill because you need more right. of that energy type or something like that. In general, there's not a lot of need. So I'm thinking of at least doing the checkpoint thing where then the scrolling gets stopped. Or I might just make it like you can scroll back a maximum of one screen with. Once you go any distance, you can only back up a little bit. You right. know what I mean? So something like that would probably work fine. It would, it'll just make it easier. One, that people won't waste time going back and forth on a level they don't need to. Especially since in this game, when an enemy disappears off screen, they're mm -hmm. just gone. Like, there's no point for them to exist anymore. Right. So uh, it's not like a Double Dragon or something where you need to defeat certain enemies to progress further in the game. Mm -hmm. Other than bosses, obviously. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I have in mind for for next time. So, otherwise, I think there was something else you had asked me that, like when we weren't recording, I can't remember oh, what it was. Oh yeah, it was with regards to the the buttons like A and B, oh, and right. which one was jump or attack. Yes. I was assuming uh, at some point we're gonna have like some sort of configuration where you can swap yes. those if you want to. There so. will definitely be a setting screen where you can customize your input and probably choose, like even on a keyboard, choose any keys that'll work for either of the buttons or at the very least to reverse the, the jump and attack buttons Right. to make sure because I know that drives me nuts when I'm used to a certain button configurations, which one is jump, which one is uh, attack. And when mm -hmm. they're quote unquote backwards, as far as I'm concerned, so I'm right. gonna, we're going to make sure that any player that's used to any button configuration will be able to switch them how they like it. So yeah, nice. that'll we'll definitely make that a feature. It's not too hard to do. So, but anyway, that's uh, that should be about it for this video. Thanks everyone for watching. <laughs>